Yeah, okay, well, thank you all very much for coming, and uh, I'm really grateful to, uh, to Jenny and Nikhil for taking part in this uh, discussion, and also to, to Verso Books and The Strand. I mean, I'm particularly grateful to Verso Books because, I mean, when I, when I discovered Raymond Williams in my, uh, my mid-twenties, in the early 1980s, um, it was a, a momentous thing for me, and really, if anyone had told me that at some point I would be writing the introduction to this uh, to this reissue of Politics and Letters, um, and I should say that we've here we are in the rare, in the rare book room, and here is my original copy of it with the 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 date of purchase, 30th of um, March 1983. God, somebody's showing their age. I mean, really, it would it would have been a, a sort of almost inconceivable honour. Um, I mean, so it's a, it's amazing for, for for me to to have ended up in such sort of proximity uh, to to Raymond Williams. Um, but, I mean, I feel I've already said something rather stupid. I mean, the idea that I discovered Raymond Williams uh, in 1983 as though he was one of those little-known, neglected authors that the NYRB Classics series specializes in sort of resuscitating. Of course, Raymond Williams by then had been, um, you know, a key figure on the left um, since, um, since 1958, incidentally the year I was born, with the publication of Culture and Society. And that was the the first book of his I read. And it really was momentous for me because I did English at university. I'd gone through the standard sort of Oxford literary education where you just read, each week you read an author from, and you go all the way through from, from Beowulf to Beckett. And then here was this book which uh, took writers that I was really very, very familiar with, but it was a completely new way, not only of seeing them, but of seeing literature. Uh, it provided the first really important point, really, where, for me, literature linked up with the broader politics. And also, for me personally, it was a really important thing for understanding the process I'd lived through. As you know, Raymond Williams was a, a signalman's son. Uh, got a kind of scholarship to Cambridge at the time when Cambridge was still almost exclusively uh, a, a ruling class place. And I feel that he, he really sort of blazed what has since become a quite well, well trodden uh, road of the, of, of the scholarship boy, if you, if you like. Um, so, I mean, I was, uh, let's say, a, a second generation, a representative of the second generation of people who'd been influenced by Raymond Williams. The previous generation had been that kind of e Eagletonian generation of sort of 1968ists. Uh, and as I say, he was a hugely important figure. By the time I'd discovered him, uh, there were it was, wasn't just culture and society. There'd been uh, The Country and the City, a very, very important book, key words. But what I've al always been interested in is the extent to which there would be a disparity between his huge reputation in in Britain, in the introduction, I quote this email from Zadie Smith, where when she was at Cambridge, he was discussed as a, a figure really on a par with these European thinkers like Foucault or, or, uh, or, or Roland Barthes. And I've never really been sure about his standing in America. And so I thought one way we could start is to hear about uh, b b how you came across him. And if you could say something about his kind of, you know, uh, his standing in America as representatives, in a way, of the generation that comes after mine, uh, in whichever order seems appropriate. I would say I remember first encountering culture and society as an undergraduate, maybe circa 1990 or something like that, in an environment that was, you know, with with people like Elaine Scarry and Philip Fisher at Harvard teaching Hardy in particular, but the 19th century novel more generally. So in one sense, I think the USN Raymond Williams tended to come much more specifically out of lit out of the study of literature and of literature departments, and even more so of the study of the 19th century novel. So that's still a biggish group of people to be interested, but I, I, that was certainly the context where I first encountered him, I would say. Um, so I actually first encountered Raymond Williams on a course description for one of Jenny Davidson's classes. <laughs> um, it was That's funny. It was, I, I, the course was 
about the idea of culture or like it's it, and it would, it would it, so, or I it teach a, I teach a seminar on the idea of culture that really in many ways was spurred by the nature and culture entries and keywords which I just think are the most magically incredible part of that book you know just in a couple pages Williams manages to capture you know he, he does etymology without being at all pedantic it's incredibly imaginative exciting way of doing intellectual history so for me Raymond Williams has served as a kind of intellectual instigator in a lot of different kinds of project, certainly in that idea of culture, of course, where I use him and then sort of starting out with some Matthew Arnold and T.S. Eliot, but then exploring much more widely 18th century texts like Robinson Crusoe and Gulliver's Travels that I see as being kind of foundational. The, the other place where I have taught Raymond Williams and keywords in particular is in an MA seminar that provides a sort of introduction to literary criticism. It's really not a history of literary criticism. The earliest books we're doing are cl classics of the genre like Seven Types of Ambiguity and Leo Marx's book The Machine in the Garden. And so when I come to teach keywords in that class, I teach it a, in an adjacent week to teaching Roland Barthes' uh, book The Neutral, the co that collection of late essays. And I really I really think of Williams and Bart. You know, I think Bart's work is much more widely read across disciplines. So, for instance, the influence in film studies and art theory and so forth, you wouldn't have find Williams having that same sort of huge widespread influence. But from their, from their such different intellectual vantage points, you see both Bart and Williams interested in doing this, you know, it's a, it's a keyword approach explicitly for Williams. And when Bart talks about it, he's more like, he, he talks about taking a term for a walk or sort of walking, walking it along the grid uh, and producing a set of terms in a library. So I realize that this is a sort of, a, it, it, it's a kind of, it's almost an anti-intellectual, it's an opportunistic way of using both of these as a way really of trying to get graduate students excited about the imaginative, creative potential of the kind of things that you can do in literary criticism, as opposed to that sort of dispiriting sense that I think PhD students often have of it as being a sort of limited, descriptive mode that doesn't perhaps have the prestige of cultural history or the heft of narrative history or something like that. Uh, and so, Nicole, after you, after Jenny sort of introduced you to Raymond Williams, what what happened to you after that? Uh, I I resisted the introduction. It was it was um, <laughs> I, I just I mean it, there was something, and I and this is I guess the way to think about my relationship with Williams, which is that I'm constantly having to I constantly resisted him and then rediscovered him. It was actually precisely he would he was then I was like who, the, I, at first the notion that one could take take a word and and actually chart its uses over time and find that it's been completely transformed w seemed seemed interesting it was it was named again in a class of mine uh, subsequently at Columbia and then when I came across the book it, it as an undergraduate it was it has that I guess combination of just inevitability and surprise that marks a classic where you just feel like of course I mean, of course, someone should do this, and then, but it's it's utterly this surprising activity and surprising book, and continually refresh, repays interest. Um, at the same time, uh, and maybe this speaks to something about Raymond Williams. You know, I, 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 I it maybe it speaks to his status in the United States. He was very, I found him very beloved and beloved in, of of English departments, and and as someone who just a sort of an unpleasant undergraduate who was not who didn't enjoy other things that people were enjoying and didn't like the fact that people were taking pleasure in other things. I felt that I should not be too into <laughs> Raymond Williams. And so, and so I kept finding my way, a, like a, finding my, a path away from him. I went to graduate school in English subsequently and, and Williams was always being cited and I, and I, I, I read, I read the, the country and the city and I read culture and society and I, and I read uh, the novel Loyalties. These were, I mean, these, in this spirit of intense resistance to what was going on, because I, I just thought, God, it's so good and, and, and yet all these English professors like him. And so I, I, <laughs> I, I was, I, surely something must be wrong. And, and so, 
it, you know, I, I, and I, I explicit, you know, when I, I, when I was writing, I would explicitly find myself writing in these Will, Williamsian modes or this pastiche, and I would <laughs> be like, God, again, Williams, you know, and, and I, and I couldn't, I couldn't find a way out of it, and it's really, I feel like only, you know, you mentioned in your introduction to the book, Jeff, that you felt like he needed to be in some ways freed from this sort of high. The, uh, and the phrase might be the Tweety Company that he's meant to keep, um, and um, which is a nice, nice way to put it. And I, it's, it's funny. I feel like it's only recently in that I've, I've really just allowed it to Williams to like enter my, to think of him as just this great figure and writer. It was after, it was after graduate school, and precisely when I, I could then just. I could I, I ceased to see him as this oppressively great figure and just saw him as a as a great writer and that and that's that's happened recently. It's funny this idea you as a as a young man sort of absorbing and trying of all the people that I can see how you know I went through a phase of trying to write like Roland Barthes which meant just putting a lot of words in italics <laughs> but uh, one of the things about uh, culture and society I mean I was reading this the other day it's um, you know Re Williams was written, writing it in his mid 30s I guess but it has this authority of a much older person so the idea that you could um, and also the Williams style is famously off-putting isn't it with its constant qualifications and its insistence on complexity this kind of stuff so I'm, I'm really quite surprised to to to, to learn that there was a, that the style had some kind of attraction for you yeah, I mean, well, it was my desire as well to be an extremely off-putting young man. I think that was like <laughs> key to the to the enterprise. At the same time, that I thought, I mean, it's true that Williams's style. It's funny the, the, the conversationally, he he has a little bit of that, but it's quite it is quite different. But in um, there's the caution, this like this this the the sudden like surge of abstractions that occasionally crops up, but like where he starts speaking about crisis and struggle and community and and but then but then there's this there is also this patience and this slowness to the accretion of detail. He goes back over certain things. It's very mesmerizing. I think no nowhere to me more so than in um, the country in the city, but. Um, yeah, it's true. I, 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 it was also I think that that he didn't, um, he didn't. What's the phrase? Like he, there was there was something completely sui generis about it. I guess I would say, and and this is true of culture and society to to a degree. Um, his books on uh, his book Modern Tragedy I found very important for me as a young person, um, where. The, it was it was not exactly aphoristic, but it was it felt like very it felt like very self assured in certain ways. It felt like it was very it was it came from a man who knew exactly who he was at any mm -hmm. given point in time, and I, and I thought I thought this was this was something that appealed to me. And and Jenny, I like this kind of comparison with Roland Barthes, and it seems to me that if we allow for the huge cultural differences between. Um, between France and Britain, it seems to me, yes, they are uh, comparable. Of course, because he was French in Paris, Roland Barthes had this whole sort of celebrity quality, which William certainly wouldn't have wouldn't have wanted. But yeah, uh, equ uh, equally important as public figures. And I was watching, God, it's funny, the kind of preparations for these things that you do now. Quite often, it really does involve watching YouTube. And there's a, an amazing thing. By the way, I should say that you, the, the great film that Mike Dibb made of the country and the city, Mike Dibb being the film director who did uh, Ways of Seeing, the Berger series, you can see his film of the country and the city, and there's uh, Raymond Williams with his little sort of walking around Cambridge in his sort of Mao hat or whatever it is. There's another bit of film, and it really is so remarkable. It's him talking to Derrida. Uh, and there they are. And, but, but the funny thing is there's Raymond Williams looking so much like this kind of rather tweedy professor of as adult education sitting there smoking his pipe, you know. Um, and there's this, you know, the ultimate sort of intellectual superstar, Derrida. Uh, so they're very, very sort of culturally different, but of a, of a similar sort of status, I think. 
In America, though, I would get the impression that you haven't got that whole supporting thing of the, you know, Williams was so stitched into the to the politics of, of British cultural life. Um, so he would exist here in sort of cocooned in a more academic way, would you, would you say? I think so, and I just don't really see there being here any c kind of close equivalent of that cultural sphere in the first place, in the sense you could say there are writers or artists who have that kind of stature, but it's, re it's hard for me to think after, you know, after the generation of Norman Mailer and Gore Vidal, for instance, after that generation, is there really a kind of cr cr critical mass of attention, public sphere, pu set of public intellectuals that are, for instance, not just of interest to the readers of the New York Review of Books, but of the broad, you know, there is no sort of television venue that we have that would be the equivalent for either the French or the English scene as different as those two are from each other. Yeah, I think the, in France they, they, there'd be a similar lament though that the day, those days are gone and so you're, you're, who are you left with? Oh, Bernard-Henri Lévy with his famously open, open neck shirt. Um, <laughs> but it's, we, we talk about television, it seems to me that one of the, the one of the Williams' things that he was so insistent on and so sort of prophetic about, and it's this, you know, in classic sort of Marxist terms, you've got this thing base, you know, which is the industry and this kind of stuff. Then you've got superstructure, the culture, um, you know, all this kind of thing. And Williams was really quite quite sort of canny, I think, about saying that actually, you know, instruments of the, the production of culture is part of the, the you know, the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the economic base. Means of communication are also means of production. And when we look now at what's happening with uh, TV and mass communicate uh, or the technologies, it seems to me that um, in some ways you can say that Oh my God! He, he his was in some ways a nostalgic vision. You know, he dies in 1988 or 1989 when the you know when the left in Britain really isn't. I mean, the left in Britain has always been in a state of crisis. I'd say it was in a state of sort of collapse. Then it's almost as though he couldn't physically survive this absolute hegemonic period of Thatcherism. But then, in terms of the media, I think this is one of the ways in which his work has been incredibly prophetic. Uh, it, I mean, it's, I hope that many of you are buying this book and are actually going to sort of read, th read through it from cover to cover, or at least dip in, but for me, one of the greatest pleasures of rereading it, the, 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 the parts of the conversation that touch on television and the politics of what you can do in live theater versus television just seem to me extraordinarily prescient, especially when you think about the specific examples that were available to him at that period. It's, you know, it's, it's a quite narrow a range, but everything that he says, you sort of jump ahead 30 years, and it's like he's exactly predicted the future. I mean, it's it, that was one of the stretches where I felt that the reading was almost uncanny in the sense of that these remarks he's making, you know, they really are anticipating, um, you know, like uh, the, the whole development in television that led to the production of The Wire and of these multi-season big scale breaking bad type dramatic investigations that's so that has so much in common with the vision of art that williams had in the 70s and his frustration with what the novel was doing and with what drama was doing and so forth right i mean you actually throughout the book you have williams complaining quite with some frequency about the novel and its its length constraints he's always ta they're always saying that he's like i i wrote 110,000 words and they made me cut 20,000 they only words. want 80 and, and it's Tight like limit of 80 and then when you read the novels you're like oh yeah they should have cut the <laughs> actually it's <laughs> good good idea but um but they're uh, except for border country that's quite that's quite a good novel um but uh but yeah so but then there he, there's a it's a it's a scottish drama i believe that he's discussing that is quite that is a a working class drama um, in, in the section specifically about television and and it's it's quite an event it's quite a cultural event and he and he speaks very highly of it and the and the NLR editors uh, are, are sort of nonplussed they're really this. skeptical like yeah they, they really are just it's hard for them to imagine that he's not pulling their leg right and he keeps on saying they're this like, about television is the great 
artistic media. Right. They're just like, television, really? Because you're just stuck, you know, I think uh, Perry or whoever it is, is uh, one of the interlocutors is saying, you're just stuck in a room by yourself and, and you're not, you know, you're And isolated. watching a tiny box. And Raymond Williams says, but there's no actual limit on what size the box. Like, it's really, uh, it's unbelievable. Right, you have true. to read the television stretch the, the, of the discussion. He, he clearly understood that you, there was a place for within home, large screen television watching. <laughs> And it's very interesting to learn. I mean, one of Raymond Williams' most famous formulations, structure of feeling, and they, they, well, let's actually, let's go, I mean, for those of you who don't know about this particular book, it's a, a series of, of interviews with uh, the, uh, the editorial board of the New Left Review, Anthony Barnett, Francis Mulhern, and, and uh, Perry, Perry Anderson. Um, and, um, <coughs> uh, where was I going with that? Um, where was I going? For those who don't know the book, oh yeah, okay. So that was a little bit yeah. So that was the it. sort of uh, that was the, uh, the the format of it, and they they take it through chronologically. Really, we go through uh, Raymond Williams's birth in in Pandy in in Wales, um, and although this is something that's been dealt with in the, the biographies that have appeared since. This was the first time when I had read anything about the fact that, you know, he's a, there he is, he's at Cambridge as an undergraduate. And then he has to, halfway through his undergraduate studies, he goes off to be a tank commander in the Second World War, a really quite extraordinary thing. So he comes back to Cambridge to complete his degree, and he's had this, you know, he's taken part in the central uh, event of, of, of the 20th century, which, which I think has a huge, it turns out, it has a huge effect on, on, uh, on his subsequent political thinking, the, doesn't uh, it? it and, and not just his political thinking, I think the, it, the introduction to the re-release of keywords is particularly vivid on this. Williams has an essay there. You sh if you don't, if you have an older edition, you won't have this new introduction, where he specifically describes coming back to Cambridge after his time away, and his sense that there's a new use of the word culture that is distinct and different from the kind of 1940 usage that he had before. And it really, it, it, it anchors that intellectual insight that was so generative across all his career in exactly that period of experience of education and war. Goodness me. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit more then about the uh, th this p this particular book, um, Politics and Letters. And, um, you know, what it's, well, I was really, I mean, it's, it's a, as you would expect with uh, the sort of interlocutors, it's of a fantastically kind of eloquent, uh, the, an the answers are, the, the questions and the answers are, are of this incredible eloquence. And I was quite interested to discover from, you know, the extent to which it was written up for publication. And I didn't get any clarification on that, but I was I was in touch with, with Anthony Barnett, who, who um, is one of the interlocutors. And he didn't, um, he didn't explain that to me, but in an email, he said, um, and this shouldn't put you off buying the book, he said he now regards this book as a catastrophe. <laughs> and it's quite interesting, really, that I mean, I'm going to read you this. Uh, so anyway, he wrote the, Anthony, uh, instead of as answering the question I wanted asking, uh, I wanted answering, which is the extent to which the questions and answers were 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 written, written. up for publication uh, he referred me to his introduction to the long revolution and i think it's worth saying that um, it's a sign i think of how of the sort of somewhat the marginalization of raymond williams's reputation this book which i had the pelican edition of the long revolution has now been reissued by parthian not Pantheon, distinguished New York publisher, but a, a Welsh publisher. And they're in the process of reissuing a number of his books. But, I mean, really, without wanting to succumb to kind of metropolitan parochialism by saying, oh, why isn't he published by a London publisher? It really is. It's, it's amazing that a figure who such a short time ago was so important, so central to the culture, now, you know, he's being published by a really quite small 
outfit. Anyway, Anthony Barnett gives this sort of context to the to, to the background to this book. Um, it arose because Terry Eagleton, who was famously a student of Raymond Williams, wrote this uh, patricidal attack, really quite vicious, on Williams in New Left Review. And we all know in these kind of leftist organizations how, you know, how, how sort of catty it can become. Um, and as some kind of reparation to, to, uh, to Raymond Williams, it, they had the idea of doing a book of interviews and this is what Anthony Barnett says I'll read it's quite it's yeah it's, it's short enough to, to merit this a book of interviews was conceived which became politics and letters an astonishing work of intellectual criticism political interrogation historical and contemporary reflection and autobiography between two towering intellectuals Williams and Anderson so I quite like the way right from the outset that although it's you know it's meant to be this tag team of Mulhern, Barnett and Anderson. It's actually basically just Raymond and Perry kind of duking it out. I was one of three NL NLR editors who participated. And while I loved the experience of listening to Williams and gossiping after the interviews, I was only a witness to the exchanges between him and Anderson and to a lesser degree Mulhern. It was only reading the book later that I realized how much it was like a trial, challenging Williams about his deviations from a proper Marxist view and obliging him to give as much ground as he could to orthodoxy. I can see now that an opportunity was lost at that moment for the review and for the left in this country to open out to the far more profound and interesting politics of democracy and refusal of Marxist reductionism that Williams pointed towards. So I guess my question to you two is, how do you like them bananas? <laughs> um, well... I don't mean to be, say, like, I have Mr. McLuhan right here, but I actually talked to Perry Anderson um, about... You, you pulled rank on me like that. <laughs> <laughs> Just went right to the top. I talked to, I talked to Perry um, the, a couple nights ago about this book, and he, um, he disputes, I guess, Barnett's... Uh, like, he says that actually it was more evenly divided, um, that he talked about the... The major books Barnett talked about politics. Mulhern talked about literary criticism, but um, but he um, just about the publication history. It is interesting. He I guess Williams. They would what they said is that they interviewed. He interviewed Williams in their in his offices, and Williams's responses were were practically went immediately verbatim into print. Really? So he's just like, he just speaks in paragraphs and this self-assured, like, and this is completely actually different from his cautious, you know, sort of like hesitant prose style otherwise, but he just speaks that way. And it's actually their questions, which in the book seem quite assured and and prosecutorial and, uh, and, and violent at times, um, violently patricidal in certain ways, that they completely had to rewrite, actually. They, so like, there, there, there's something weird about the whole, it's like, it's, um, it's, but it, it's true that it's, it's like an incredibly dramatic book, and it's like, it's, it's and because, you know, as, as um, Jeff just indicated, it's not like a Paris Review interview where they're like, what do you, how do you write? Do you write in the mornings? Although it turns out he does, but he's just like, you know, but, um, but that's, it's more just, it's like on page 183 of uh, Culture and Society, you say this. On page 193, you say this. How do you reconcile these two statements? Williams responds with this very eloquent uh, defense and retraction of some things, and then they say, that reconciliation doesn't satisfy us. And then they, and then they continue to prosecute him, and then he concedes some more, and then, but then, and then adds more, and it's like, it's an incredible performance. I mean, it's, it, I, I, I really just do, do think it's an extraordinary, it's, it's a singular kind of book. I, I sort of It is, it's almost its own genre. It should go in its own, uh, under, an, an, in an interesting collection of special kinds of dialogue. I mean, if, I'm sure that many of you have conducted interviews or been interviewed. And you know really how different the texture is of words that have been transcribed from speech versus, you know, and so it, 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 what Nikhil says actually, it makes sense, it, fit, it fits with my sense that Williams was one of these exceptionally clear, fluent speakers. I can buy it that his responses didn't take a ton of revision in order to be, you know, get done in this form. And it's one of the reasons that the kind of prosecutorial aspect 
of the questions comes through so strongly is that they're three paragraphs long. I mean, they must have they must have expanded and exploded as the interviews got revised for publication. And one of the things that was most impressive to me, I mean, it's like a sort of unpleasant dissertation defense or something like that. You know, it's got this real grilling, um, you know, political orthodoxy kind of feel to it. But it is is quite impressive and striking the extent to which Williams does not become defensive when contradictions in his own work are pointed out. He's very comfortable talking about uh, a, a book as something, uh, or an opinion in a book as something that he expressed at the time, and he often will offer a perspective or an intellectual context that sort of gives you an account of why that contradiction should have been there, and then actually suggests that some later piece of work was in some sense an attempt to resolve that contradiction. It, it's, a, it's, an, it's an aspect of his intellectual temperament that I think you can see in the books themselves, but that comes out very nicely in, in in his kind of intellectual patterns of response. Yes, it's, it's really quite quite interesting how the, the tone of the, the tenor of the questions is so sort of fixed in that very 1970s kind of theoretical, uh, sort of almost Althusserian kind of uh, style, isn't it? It's, I mean, it's, it's honestly, it, the, that tone comes more strongly as you approach the middle of the book, too. Because Indeed. the early materials, this autobiographical stuff about whales and reading and the relationship to Levis and practical criticism, uh, the questioners aren't so invested yet in orthodoxies there, and then you come into these middle career positions. Well, what? How is your theory of realism really different from Lukács's? And what isn't it a problem that you said this? You know, that, so that's where you get into that mode very, very strongly, and you really get the sense. I mean, it's as if Raymond Williams is sort of you know, he manages to just about transcend the kind of grim parochial of that discourse, but you can imagine how much time he must have spent and energy, you know, kind of um, in that kind of conversation during those years. I thought it was very depressing. Yeah, it's I, I, I see what you're saying, I, I, and this again ties, I was just thinking about this as I was going back through a lot of Williams's work. Uh, I mean, the Williams that I, I think I knew as a as an undergrad and certainly as a graduate student was the kind of father of cultural studies. I think that's like that's one of his, and so and a lot of that is sort of the later uh, Williams. Some of the he wrote these essays that were actually published by uh, Verso. I mean, and so they or by, by New Left Books slash Verso. This, uh, problems in materialism well, and culture. Exactly. Yeah, and writing and society and and they're actually and and Marxism and literature. I don't know if it was published by Verso, but they're much more of a piece, I mean, they, they, they're sort of making a rapprochement with, like, with that wider Marxist culture and, I mean, or, or mode of argument. And, and I liked them a while ago, and now I find them vastly inferior, actually, I think, to, like, the, to the earlier works, which actually, in their own way, are sort of ex nihilo. They're, mm -hmm. They just are so singular, and they're so strange, and, and mm -hmm. so, whereas the other ones are seem to be making many more concessions to the style of argument. And, I, and it almost makes me, I wonder about the effect of this, this prosecution on his, on his work, or maybe, the, I mean, or at least partly what the effect was. Indeed. Wow. Well, this is, I mean, we could, could go on for a long while, but I'm sure um, some of you have some questions which uh, um, I know the other two will be able to answer if I can't. Uh, please wait for the microphone to come because it will be recorded. And unlike Perry Anderson and Mulhern, you won't get a chance to improve this in the writing, so you, you are obliged to speak in perfectly formed sentences. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, I suppose that, that was, was a, an that was a way yeah. of introducing that. <laughs> Um, how would you compare him to the writer George Tro? The writer George Tro. Tro George Trow, the New Yorker writer. Yeah, Trow. I don't. I'm not sure how that name is properly pronounced. Um, does one of you want to take I, that on? I'm English, so I don't have to talk about it. I don't know this New Yorker writer. I'm afraid. Um, I only know. So I only know that. That, that essay that in the context of no context, which is, um, and, and I don't know it very well, so this, I, I don't know if this is gonna be a very satisfying answer, but my sense, I mean, I just, uh, Williams is not, uh, you know, that essay has a kind of uh, experimental quality to it, and Williams is not 
uh, he's not an experimental writer in that sense. I mean, he is a, he is a very interesting writer. He's actually, and he's quite, and he's, and in some ways, breathtaking. And, Keywords and, might be considered the exception to that in the true. sense that's that it's abecedarian. I mean, it's yeah, part yeah. of the appeal of that one for me. No, that's a good. That's 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 a, good, a very good point. I think, I mean, because keywords is like a, it. It's even though it's like a very useful book, it's also it has like a, it its quality is a, it's a very innovative book in that way, but um, but I don't see. Yeah, I wouldn't. I'm trying to think of who he's who I would compare him to, but not to Tro. I mean, I guess you know the weird thing to me actually is. The, the figure that I always thought of Williams as being most like in the United States was C. Wright Mills. I think that there's, right. um, and Mills died very young, um, and so was not as large a presence, but he also had a, a similar um, presence in the American New Left, uh, and then was also sort of put out of court uh, in, at, at a, su a subsequent date, in the way that Williams, I think, has been in, in the UK and in general, just this sort of, as, as being part of this radicalizing moment in, in mid, mid to late 20s, to, to the, from the 50s to the 70s, that is, we don't have to deal with anymore. I think in, in the UK context, it seems to be that he's, um, he's no longer you know the, that the labor movement that he was associated with has been stymied or defeated, and and all the things that he you know he's a s sentimental figure. I think that was the criticism. And with Mills, there's something similar about that. I, I mean, in a way, I think you have to go further afield in order to find anything that would be an equivalent. So as to say, the name of James Baldwin is hovering in my mind, and so you there's no equivalent of the new left in Britain in the U.S. But you could take the civil rights movement, and you could think about the way that an essayist and novelist like Baldwin had a had a stature that was really above any anybody else's, right? In some yes. in some kind of a way. But I think crucially, of course, Baldwin has a considerable reputation as a novelist. Um, yes. And one of the things about Williams is that uh, I remember, as he when he sort of retired from academia, he could. Uh, devote himself to writing, you know, his, this book, The Saga of the Black Mountains. And I was working at a British publisher, and I was really excited when this, you know, the manuscript, the, the unreadable manuscript eventually came through. And I think, you know, if Re Williams has any reputation now as a fiction writer, it would be solely on the basis of his first novel, The Border, uh, Border Country, which is the opposite of experimental. It's, it, it's quite an interesting thing. It's about this father, you know, the father figure. But you can see it really. It's, it's basically, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the mold for that book is Sons and Lovers. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just, pr it's sort of pr pre, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, inc it's incredibly, uh, it's incredibly traditional, and, and the others are just, just deadly dull, I think. Um, anyway, are there any other questions? <laughs> I think you could maybe also uh, compare Raymond Williams with, say, Herbert Marcuse as a foundational figure for the American New Left with a book like One Dimensional Man, which was sort of like a Bible of American cultural studies and the foundation of like the student leftist movement, especially in the 60s, in which now almost nobody reads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I think Williams, like, in, I was just, I think he's, he actually writes about Marcuse in politics, in his journal, Politics and Letters, and and is not super fond of Mark. I mean, there's, there's a, you know, there's actually very, I mean, that's another question is like, there's not, the relationship between Williams and culture is much, uh, I mean, it's, he's, he has much more sanguine ideas about culture than, in some ways, than the, uh, than the Frankfurt School, despite their that paramount interest in it. But yeah, no, it's, I, I totally agree. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, you certainly can. We'd be grateful. Um, could you could you um, speak to Nancy Mitford and the you and non you type classifications and whether there are parallels here or not? Wow. I, uh, could you elaborate on that uh, before I, I attempt like an I don't answer? I know enough about it to say something intelligent. Oh, it looks like Jenny I, I, is coming I to mind. I give you a bit of a gloss on that. <laughs> if, if you want something more just sort of associative and to fill in context. So one reason I think that we can't find close USian equivalents for Raymond Williams as a figure is that we just don't have 
class on the table in the 1930s and 1940s in no, but, but let, let me get let me get to that part of the point. So as to say, you're sounding like Raymond Williams now, Jenny. I'm I'm saying I'm saying Mitford, Mitford, Mit, the, the existence of Mitford and people like her and their dominance and cultural authority is part of the necessary condition for a Raymond Williams, Welsh, fringe, leftist, working class to emerge and to have a distinct cultural identity, right? So the, the play for, playful Mitfordian kind of attentiveness to these fine distinctions of you and non-you, you know, napkin versus serviette, I think is one of the classic examples there. But it, it's exactly that kind of you know, the way that ev everybody in England at that period was so attuned to the way that a word choice would mark somebody as being actually sort of lower middle class horribly when they should have been middle or middle when they should have been upper middle and so forth, right? So, um, it, so Mitford and Will Nancy Mitford and Williams are basically political opposites. Jessica Mit Mitford would have had more in common politically with Raymond Williams, but it's the class background that separates Mitford's from Williams's that I think is so crucial here, and that's part of the context that kind of makes sense of some of these more parochial controversies here, but that the US audience may not have such a keen feel for. Oh, thank you, Jenny. You've provided me with a way into this uh, to this question. Yeah, I mean, one of the important things for me about discovery, about reading Raymond Williams is that, uh, yeah, I'd grown up thinking that these sort of class differences were all about these kind of things, like whether you said serviette or napkin or whatever. And you know, it really wasn't until I read William, Raymond and Williams that I realized oh god it's actually not about that it's about power relations this kind of stuff and so still we're getting this still in the papers you'll get this kind of stuff that about whether you know the way that you do this or that determines what sort of class you are and it's just Williams is so insistent uh, 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 about that in a kind of classically Marxist way and I think his um, you know, one of the things that gives him his confidence and authority is his formation as a, you know, growing up in this Welsh community in Wales. But it's quite interesting that the class thing, there's an essay by Perry Anderson in his book Spectrum uh, about E.P. Thompson. And he talks, there's another of these little disputes within the left. Um, uh, E.P. Thompson rather snidely in an essay wrote about the way that Williams had been perhaps uh, incorporated into the kind of ruling class academy. And he rather snidely says something about, oh, the sort of, you know, the, the sunlit quadrangles, the discussion over glasses of port, this kind of stuff. And uh, Perry Anderson says something like, you can say, you can see how this must have rankled with Raymond Williams, the, you know, the signal son and then he narrates this great thing where later on and of course he and uh, uh, E.P. Thompson had, you know, they were, they were sort of really they're closely related politically. When E.P. Thompson uh, moved into his posh country house, you know, Williams was able to s to rather snidely talk about country house Marxism. But I think this is it's one of it. You're absolutely right, Jenny. You know, it's this treacle of British life. You can't move for it. And you know, Perry Anderson is the uh, you know Perry Anderson, this great beacon of the of the left. You know, the the Eton educated Perry Anderson. Yeah, if I could just add a couple sort of more personal comments. I have always been aware that one reason I'm so drawn to Raymond Williams as a figure is that I had a Scottish grandfather who came from a very similar social background and who did a degree at, at Glasgow Teachers Training College and then was also in the Royal Signal Corps during the war and was a prisoner of war during World War II. And the sense that I got from him and from my Scottish grandmother of the ways that, for instance, as children, they spoke Scots and it had it sort of not literally beaten out of them at school, but the ways that they were kind of brought into this. You know, the Scottish version of the education system is rather more egalitarian in many respects, I think, certainly was then uh, compared to the English one. And so uh, the, uh, I, the, the experiences that Williams has clearly resonate very broadly for others in that milieu. But the, the other thing that 
what you just said about E.P. E. Thompson made me think of is that very disconcertingly, the other book that I was reading last week was Antonia Fraser's memoir, My History, which could hardly be a funnier and stranger juxtaposition in terms of giving you the sense of the extraordinary privilege of the political class, labor and Tory, in Indeed. the England of the 1940s and 50s. So it's, I, it's, I recommend that, that one too as a sort of like mind-bending alternate <laughs> universe of what's going on in the same years. Um, I just, if I could just quickly add something, th because there is a, there, the, I, it is true though that Williams, you know, that despite it's, I mean, he mentions, I think it's in this book or maybe somewhere else that everything he writes is against official English culture. It's something to that effect, but that his, I mean, one of his greatest, uh, in some ways, exponents to me was always Edward Said. I, that actually, Said's, mm. I mean, culture and imperialism is very much indebted and explicitly to Williams, and he's constantly referencing Williams and sort of ideas about the formation of 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 the nation in, in in England and what it excluded, what it was based on, what it what sort of dispossessions it was based on. This 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 you can this gives you access suddenly to all kinds of other kinds of dispossessions. So there's a way in which He's, he's, and I think the new, the new left review people are trying to constantly nail him as this kind of parochial figure, but he's actually, but, or, nosta or, sort or nostalgic. Of idealizing, idealizing yeah. wishful thinking, exactly. naive, you know, they, you definitely can tell that they're skeptical about the weight that he wants to put on that Welsh per identity and cultural identity. Yeah, but it's somehow at the bottom of that identity is not that identity it's it opens out into I and mean, that's why i think he always called himself a welsh european, european. yeah yeah and the last question will be from last my question here my, my great friend sukdev uh, sandu um i was just struck by um your kind of memory of uh, the late 1980s because growing up i remember he already seemed pretty fossilized by the late 80s and looked back from a vantage point of today uh, the ascendancy of a, the audibility of a Welsh voice with all the sort of dignity, the, the sense of kind of masculine collectivity, its relationship to kind of unionite struggle. That had, of course, been on the sort of wane ever since the end of a miners' strike. Um, yeah. And you mentioned Edward Said. I remember going to a conference as a student where him and Tom Pauline were sniggering audibly when uh, William's name came up and they were giggling about, oh, yeah. What does a structure of feeling even mean? This isn't maybe 1994, 95, and it was clear that by then Williams seemed really old fashioned. He wasn't talking about gender. He wasn't primarily talking about race. He was clearly no friend of postmodernism. That, that eloquence that you all s s spoke about very eloquently almost um, damned him. So it didn't seem lightweight, it didn't seem flexible, it didn't seem in any way groovy. It seemed old, solid, like a kind of free volume 19th century book. And I think your, your um, experience at Columbia is rather different from mine, where I, I'm struck how invisible he is in most, um, or in many American universities, because he's seen as kind of pre-identity, pre-culture wars, old, gravid, sober, not really a sort of central figure in the syllabus of Marxist studies, and not, not, as, not as funky as Stuart Hall when it comes to <laughs> cultural studies. And yeah, just to conclude, but floating around on the internet a couple of weeks ago, there was um, um, a speech at a political rally in Wales by the actor Michael Sheen, talking in defense of trade unions, in, of the welfare state, um, of the NHS, and I had this momentary flashback because his voice sounded like Richard Burton. It sounded deep and baritone-like, or maybe Paul Robeson in the, 1930, uh, in the 30s. And what seemed at one time to be old and solid and kind of cripplingly working classist now seemed electric and fiery and important and speaking to imperatives both within the UK and, and internationally. So it's a striking time for the book to, to come out and so Williams's legacy is to be re-explored because he's been through a kind of doldrums, but I think from today's vantage point, this contribution he's made seems more and more important uh, than it has for a long time. Ah, uh, Sukhdev, man, we, we come from the same county in England, so I think, I mean, unless you have anything to say to that, I think we're, I, I'm happy to let Sukhdev have the 
the, the last word. Well, except for me to say thank you for all for coming. And I mean, really thank you too. As I walked here, I was so getting increasingly nervous about being out of my depth. So I mean, really, it's been such a, such a pleasure listening to you. So, so thank you all. And the book is, as I think you've gathered, uh, amazing. So do please, uh, do please buy copies. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.